probably wondering, what's he doing back on YouTube again? Well, this is the situation. Uh, I was exposed to someone with COVID and uh, exhibiting some of the symptoms, even though so far the test has been negative. So we decided to have virtual church this week. And welcome to you all. A couple of things. We're going to be dealing with the gospel today. The gospel is from St. Luke. St. Luke, as we know, is the beloved physician. Indeed, first Sunday in October, St. Luke's Day, is an honoring of doctors, nurses, therapists, physical and mental, all those who help do God's work. St. Luke is a very important person to us as we study scripture. Without St. Luke, there would be no parable of the Good Samaritan, no parable of the prodigal son. There would be no angels preaching to shepherds and outcasts. Indeed, St. Luke makes women partners. Indeed, the major recipients and tellers of the good news in the gospel. St. Luke is a very, very great and wondrous evangelist. He deals early on in the book with the silence of God, what happens when things seem so wrong. Is John the Baptist, his dramatic people, are wondrous things. And today we use St. Luke's Gospel. It's the fourth chapter. And in it, St. Luke echoes the words of the prophet Isaiah in the 61st chapter, where Isaiah reminds all of us that a prophet like an evangelist is the giver of gospel or prophetic medicine. God alone has what we need to cure us. Jesus, in bringing this text to the attention of the synagogue in Nazareth, which is by no means uh, a place where the zip code would be E-I-E-I-O, it's a very vibrant small city. Think of it like f as being Flint in the 50s and 60s. Jesus comes as a visiting rabbi. The chasen, that's a fancy word for the custodian, brings him the scroll of Isaiah. And after he reads, he sits down. Now, when a rabbi sits down. That means he's there to teach you something special. And what Jesus is telling us is that the year of Jubilee, the year of freeing people in body and spirit, freeing them from debt, freeing them from exploitation, freeing them from slavery, has begun. Any of you that are familiar with the Civil War know that the Emancipation Proclamation, the activities of the Union Army were seen as the year of jubilee by the back church, black church. So let's, let's look at what is happening. It's from the 14th chapter, excuse me, the 4th chapter, the 14th through the 21st verse. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the prophet Isaiah scroll was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me 
to proclaim release to the captives, recovery to the sight of the blind, and let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. The gospel of our Lord and our Savior. Praise to you, O glorious and wondrous God. Not too long ago, I received an invitation to be a part of a church anniversary to help celebrate the 140th anniversary of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Streeter, Illinois, where I served as assistant, temporary pastor, and assistant again. So I say to you at St. Paul's, happy anniversary. I also received a notice that the 50th anniversary of my graduating from university is coming up. Well, when you get that many invitations to an anniversary, you can't help but thinking. So I played back my time there. The good, the bad, the ugly, and the wicked, horrible, ugly with whipped cream and raisin sauce. You see, after about Ten months, the head pastor, Henry Flesner, wonderful, wonderful man, left. And I was by myself with a thousand-member church for over a year. Our official unemployment rate was 18%. Now, normally you add 7 to 10% for the actual unemployment rate. I had 65 funerals. There were days where I would have three funerals a day. But while I was there, I began to realize that our young people needed to be talked to about death, and dying, and illness. The young persons group had built itself up. We had a Sunday school class where we had chairs out into the hall. So I got together some of the folks in the community to talk to the kids who had lost grandparents, who had lost moms, dads, brothers, sisters. I got the funeral, two of the funeral directors, John Crestus and Harold Hagee, wonderful, wonderful men, to talk about the funeral, preparing the body, helping the family. I got Sister DeLillis from St. Mary's Hospital. Sister DeLillis worked with the dead and the, the dying. Dr. Theobald, our doctor, came and talked. And thanks to Barb Laurie, we got Dr. Shaw, the resident oncologist, to talk to the kids. Now, Dr. Shaw was Muslim, but he was very, very very sensitive and gracious to those young people and to all of us. He began his presentation by saying, I can treat a body, I can treat an illness, but that is not enough. I always tell all my patients, do you have a faith relationship? If you don't, I can't help you. If you are willing to, I can make some recommendations. But you see, spirit and body work together. And somewhere up in heaven, St. Paul was going, yes, indeed. You see, St. Paul believed that human beings were a combination of flesh, that is in Greek, sarx, and pneuma, which is spirit. Put together, they become summa, 
blending of body and soul. Physicians, psychiatrists, realize that. Bill Bryson, in his great new book, The Human Body, an owner's manual, talks about how the most key thing in working with people is a loving and caring approach. Leo Biscaglia, for a long time, said this thing, same thing. And if you want something even more, Martin Luther said that all doctors need to be, be sealed sorge, that is, doctors of the soul. Indeed, one of his own sons became a doctor, Peter. We need to realize that we are held captive, that we are blinded, not merely by physical ailments, but diseases of the spirit. We need to realize that the body needs gospel medicine. Gospel medicine. We can't look at the human body like a transmission, like a front-wheel drive unit. We must look at it as something, as the psalmist said, fearfully, meaning wondrously put together, the psalmist said in the 139th Psalm. I'm reminded of someone I took a spirituality course with, Peter Brett, who was the uh, spiritual advisor to the, at that time, Archbishop of Canterbury. Peter was talking about preaching out in the streets in England, and you get a very lively exchange when you do that. And Peter said, you've got to give your heart to God. And someone in the audience said, heart? It's nothing more than a pump. Well, Peter, being very quick, immediately said, I can see you are a single man. How do you know that? Well, if you fell in love with someone, you probably, based on what you say, would say, I give you my pump. And at that point, you are done and you are dusted. Luke was that sort of doctor, sealed sorga, physician of the soul. And in his medicine chest was the wonder of Jesus Christ. That's why this text was so important to him. No matter how bleak, no matter how up, how down, how sidewards we are, the gospel medicine says, you, you matter to God. Your spirit, your body matter to God. And in this time where we feel the brutality, the abrasiveness of COVID-19, Jesus Christ, wants us to know, wounded in body and spirit, that you will be met with the gospel medicine, the gospel medicine. What is the first medicine that is unpacked? Forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. Those times you have played yourself or others short, those times where you have doubted others or yourself, those times where you have held on to vengeance rather than victory, those times where you have played yourself as the victim those horrors, big or small, that keep you bound by what they did or you did or didn't do. Those things that blind you to the truth about you, that you are God's beloved. The soul drug that says, be not 
afraid. I wonder the side effects knowing that God is with you always. That every day the morning's hush when you wake up and somehow you're scared in the middle of the night take that gospel medicine that says I am with you always. That I am willing to hang on your cross, share your grave, yet triumph over it. That where you are held up, where you are emotionally hijacked, where you have allowed yourself to stray from those things that you love, Jesus' gospel medicine says, come to me. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who is here forever and ever. In this darkness, Dr. Luke opens up that gospel medicine bag that you are the light of the world, that you are the salt of the earth, that you are, no matter how blasted, vulnerable, and hurting, you are a masterpiece in the kingdom of God. And what Jesus does through the miracle and the sacrament of baptism every day is remind you that no matter how grubby no matter how fear-filled your life, that which hijacks you, that which keeps you blinded, that which keeps you in chains is not the final word. That when Christ was born, your body was dignified by holiness. When Christ was on the earth, you were the recipient of God's good news. That when Christ died, when Christ lay in the tomb, all that was blessed with his presence. But they are not the final word. The resurrection is not only something that happens once. It happens every time you remember who you are, whose you are and the power that is at work. Where do you need a jubilee? Where do you need to shed the change, to open your eyes to the possibilities of who you are and what you can do, that you may be the gospel medicine for someone else? I fear that we give more glory to that which enslaves us, than that which frees us. Let me give you an example. There was a zoo that had bars, basically, for all the animals, and the animals all their life would pace back and forth in this small enclosure. And then one day, the idea came, zoos without bars. There was a polar bear named Clotilda, and so they took Clotilda out of the cage. And they brought her into this wondrous place of waterfalls, ice flows, and other polar bears. But what did poor Clotilda do? She went back and forth, back and forth. The chains, the bars, the cage was gone. Yet she lived her life going back and forth. Where do you just go back and forth? Where do you yearn to have Jesus unroll the scroll and announce that you are free and worthwhile? Where do you need the gospel medicine to be in your life? You see, you may be for others, as Dr. Luther said, a little Christ to share that gospel medicine that against all evidence, God does 
miracles, that against all human possibilities, God does grace. So let Jesus sit down with you. Let Jesus teach you that you are the salt of the earth, that you are someone worthwhile. And when you do, you will have the peace of God. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life and life eternal. The people of God say, Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are deeply, deeply tired of all that is happening and happened. Come to the synagogue of our soul. Unroll the scroll. Come, remind us where we are bound, where we are held down by others or ourselves. Jesus means freedom. Come to those areas where we do not see the positive, the wondrous, the miracles yet to be. Give us eyes. Remind us that you who took the ruins of Jerusalem and built a new temple and built a new people, you that took the ruins of chaos, destruction, death, crucifixion, occupation, have come to make us free. Free us from playing small. Free us from playing footloose and fancy free in the wrong directions. Free us to embrace that love that comes from the heart that beats forever for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord Christ, be with all those in need this day, all those undergoing test, trial, and treatment, all those scared, all those lonely, all those who have no one to pray for them, all those who are wrestling with illness of body and spirit. We name them in our hearts before you. We ask your healing presence for those who mourn, those who find no hope, those whose body or mind is betraying them. Come. Come into the stuffy synagogues of our souls and theirs and do grace. Be with those who minister to human beings of body and spirit, physical therapists, mental health therapists, Doctors, nurses, nurses' assistants, custodians, dieticians, and all manner of workers be with those who bear the burdens of ministry, of those who stock the shelves, deliver the mail, drive the trucks, fly the planes, our first responders, those in our military, we name them in our hearts before you. Be their shield, their guardian, their deliverer. Stretch forth your love to them, to their families, and all those we name this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remind us that each of us is a gospel medicine, that there are souls that need what we have and what we bring. Help us, Lord, to seize moments of ministry. Help us to give love where there is none, to give an embrace where there is none, to give an encouraging word where there is none, to feed the hungry, to hold to clothe the naked, to grant relief to those deeply in debt. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things we ask in the name of him who taught us to pray with boldness and confidence, as Dr. Luther reminds us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lancelot Andrews, who translated the Greek and Bible into English, once said on a day like today, when the road is stiff, when the sun seems to have retreated, may God grant you a beaker of sunshine from the south. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with confidence and grant you threefold peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. I hope to see you in church.